Hey, good morning, everybody. I am the voice, Pastor Q. Thank you guys for tuning into our broadcast this morning. Thank you for uh, just tuning in, being allowing yourselves to fellowship with us this morning, present your home or whatever space you're in. We're going to open up with our scripture reading. Our scripture reading is going to come from the book uh, Romans, chapter six, I believe, is uh, verses fifteen to twenty-three. Uh, uh, the usher, uh, Charmaine, is going to do the reading for us this morning. So, Charmaine, come on up. That's the book of Romans, chapter six, and verses uh, fifteen through. 23. Amen. 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 Good morning, church. Good morning. Romans 6, 15 reads, Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God, once you were slaves of sin, but now you are wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin and you become slaves to righteous living. Because of the weakness of your human nature, I am using the illustration of slavery to help you understand all of this. Previously, you let yourself be slave to impurity and lawlessness, which led ever deeper into sin. Now you must give yourself to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become holy. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. And what was that the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do, things that, that end in internal doom. But now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and the result of internal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the hear, doer, and read of his word this morning. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Turn me to the book of Mark. The book of Mark, I believe it's uh, Mark chapter 5. And then when you turn to Mark chapter 5, keep your hand in the book of Luke chapter 15. So turn to Mark chapter 5, and then keep your hands with me also in the book of Luke around the uh, 15th chapter of the book of Luke. I'm going to preach from both, teach from both aspects of those this morning. Praise God. Good morning to everyone. Thank you guys for tuning into our broadcast this morning. I'm going to read Mark chapter 5 first. He says, Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all, she had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I may be made well. Mark chapter, that was Mark chapter 5. Now go over to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 says this. A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So, she, so he divided to them his livelihood, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Notice this, that in both of the stories I'm going to preach from today, it is called, Your Issue Will Cost You. Your issue will cost you. That is the day's message. Notice this. At the end of both of these, both of them had what? Spent all they had. Mm -hmm. Father God, we thank you for your message today. We thank you, Father God, for uh, revealing of your word. We thank you, Father, that no flesh will be glorified in your presence. Father God, give me the ability to be able to teach your word, oh, Father God, that your people may hear it and be able to draw close to you. Yes, Father. Thank you, Father God, that you have sent me in the teaching of the word. Thank you, Lord, that I'm covered with your blood in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Notice as I was saying in both scriptures, at the end of them, both spent all. The first one going back to the book of Mark chapter 5, the woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years, meaning that she was dealing with this particular issue that she had. It was a, a physical issue that she had within her body. And the Bible said for 12 years she had been dealing with this issue. But the key thing I wanted to point out, it says that, and she has suffered many things from many physicians. She has spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. And the thing is that what I was teaching upon today, what God gave me the message is that, you know what, your issue is going to cost you. What does that mean when I say your issue is going to cost you? We, a lot of times we have so many issues that's in us that we're trying to fix by buying things, right? Oh my God. Come to on, be able man. to fix those issues when we only, the, the need, the issue that we have is a God issue. It's a spiritual issue. Yeah. It's not a fleshly issue. 
So what happens is how much money have we spent trying to fix the things that's in our lives? And the thing is, what happens is we find ourselves asking for more money, thinking that what? That's is going to be the key to fixing everything. The Bible says for the love of money is the what? The root. There's nothing said is wrong with the money. People think when Jesus said that the rich man would not inherit the kingdom of heaven, he said that rich people couldn't go to heaven. That's not what the scripture is teaching. He said, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Meaning that, listen, he said, is if, if you get to the root of the problem, you'll find out that the root of the problem is what? The love of what? Money. Now, not in this particular situation with this woman is that this woman wants to get better, but she's tried everything before she has actually had a chance to be able to meet and try Jesus. The thing about the story is, is that, you know what? She has tried everything. How many of us gotten to a place where we have tried just about everything? We've tried this person's way of doing it. We've tried this way of life. And the thing is that everything that we've tried outside of God has what? Cost us something. Notice this. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice this. What God is trying to give us right now is what? A gift. The prodigal son, just going back to that story. The Bible says that when he left his father's house, he took his inheritance and he said he went and spent all he had on what? Riders living. Now the thing about it is, is that if going deeper into the story, we found out that the prodigal son blew all of his money on harlots and the baby said riders living and gambling, all type of things like that. So what happened once he got once he got his inheritance, something drove him away from the father, meaning that Jesus is using an analogy here of teaching. Something drove him away from the father. And no, as further away that he got away from God, the more he what spent. Notice this when he was closer to God, he wasn't doing a lot of spending. Right. But the further I get away from God, the what more spending I'm doing. This, there's a teaching somewhere in that because the more, the further I get away from God, the more things that I have to be able to possess to be able to keep me. The Bible says that a man's life does not consist in the things that what he possess. Jesus said that. He said, listen, a uh, man's life does not consist of the things that he possess. Meaning that, listen, life is not all about what you have. Jesus said, I came to give you life and to give you life what more abundantly. He said the enemy comes to what? Kill, steal, and destroy. But he says, I've come to give you life and to give you a life more abundant life. When we begin to think about abundant life, we begin to think of what? More things that we have. Failing to realize that if we don't have God, but we have things, we'll end up spending everything that we have. My God. Trying to get God back. Just what God does. He, does. he does this as he did with the woman. He allows us. Let me tell you what great place to be in, which this woman is in. She spent everything she had. But you know what the, the greatest thing about life is that when you spend everything you have, the only thing you have left is faith. That's it. And faith was the only thing that you needed from what? The beginning. The thing is, now God will let you get to a place that you spend all everything you have till you get to a place where the only thing you have is the very thing that you need. See, the thing is that God will let us run out of all of our ways of doing things. He'll let us run. He'll let us try this. He'll let us try that. He'll let you try everything, and God is just sitting there waiting. Notice this. He said, I'll draw closer to you. If you draw nearer to me, I will draw nearer to you. Mm -hmm. At the end of that story, the prodigal son, notice that the father had never moved. He was always still there waiting for him. Matter of fact, the father was waiting for him to come back. That's what God will do. God will sit and wait for us to come out. God will sit and wait for us to spend everything we have trying to fix it ourselves. For there's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Le Trust in the Lord all thy heart, lean not to thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall what? Direct thy paths. Notice this, that the father is always still there waiting. The woman spent everything she had, and it said that she began to grow worse because she tried everything that was out there. And that's how we get to a place. You know what? I'm going to try this. I'm going to try that. The Bible says this, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and she had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she became that when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. The Bible says that what faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. She heard about Jesus. She said heard something new. But here's the thing is she heard about those other doctors, too. But at this present time, though, she heard about Jesus, but she didn't have anything to give Jesus but faith. The Bible says what? Faith is a substance of things hoping for the evidence of things what? Not seen. Meaning that, listen, when she came to Jesus, she came to Jesus with faith. Notice that she came to all the other doctors and physicians with what? Money. money. Because they required what? Money. money. Everybody required something of her that was going to cost her. That's why I'm very careful. I was watching watch these ministry. I was watching TV this morning, and the guy was trying to sell something called Miracle Water. Notice this. They're trying to sell you something, but they're not trying to give you anything. Oh my God. Now, when Jesus met the woman at the well, 
He asked her for something, but basically to create a conversation. We understand that Jesus asked the woman in the world. He said, give me drink. And she began to go into conversation. She says, listen, Samaritans and the Jews have no dealings. Why are you talking to me? And Jesus says, listen, he goes back to her and he tells her. And I think that's somewhere in the book of, uh, I'll go to it. He said, listen, he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that is talking to you, you would have asked him for drink and he would have given you what? Living water. He says, if you knew who it was you were talking to, you would have asked him of drink and he would have given you living water. Turn, I, I, I'll give you the story. Go to the book of John, just so I, doesn't, I don't quote it wrong. I'm going to come back to this. I'm trying to get to a place, though, in his teaching here. Book of John, chapter 4, where he talks to the woman at the well. John, chapter 4, he says this, verse 10. Jesus answered and said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and what he would have given you what living water. Listen, notice this. The woman has an issue. The Bible is not even really telling you about her issue. But Jesus is noticing her issue. He says, you know what? I want to give you something that you need for your issue. When the woman began to converse with him, she said, the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? I taught this a few weeks before that it was a well standing beside the well. The woman was going to the well, but Jesus in pictures positioned himself leaning on the well. The well is standing beside the well because there's two different wells. There's a well that can quench your physical thirst and there's a world that can quench your spiritual thirst. Yes. Jesus says, I'm trying to give you something that's going to quench your what? Spiritual thirst. So when he's standing there, he's giving basically the option. He says this to her. He says, the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then did you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this world to drink from it himself as well as his son as his livestock? Jesus answered and said, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. He's talking about the physical water, but here he goes to the spiritual. He said, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus says, listen, I want to be able to give you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to help you with your thirst. When we begin to think about the thirst of life, there's a thing in us, which is our spirit that has a thirst. A lot of times we don't understand what the thirst of the spirit feels like. So we try to do is replace it with things that cost us. Every time the spirit of God has a craving, has a yearning, we replace it for something. It has a void. And notice this. The woman has an issue and she's trying to replace it. But the thing is, though, that what the woman needs is she needs something from God. She needs something from Jesus. The prodigal son spends everything he has. And then you know what? He has nothing left. I like the story about the prodigal son. A lot of people teach it wrong. They say, you know what? When the prodigal son came back, notice this. He came back broke. He wasn't restored of his finances. He was restored of his relationship. That's right. That's right. But people teach it. Well, the father, when he came back to the father, the father gave him everything back. That's not what the father did. The father celebrated him being back and he didn't restore to him his finances. He restored to him what? His relationship. You know why? Because the relationship will restore the financial part. But notice that we're taught that the financial part will restore the relationship. It's wrong. The relationship will restore the financial part. Because if God restores your financial part, he has not restored the relationship. If I restore your finances right now, I will allow you to be able to go back out there and do what you've been doing before. If I paid all your credit cards off and all your debt right now, you'll be right back in debt in the next couple of weeks. Because I never fixed the very thing that got you into debt. When the woman came to the well, he says, listen, I'm going to make it so that you'll never thirst again. The Bible says even the very hairs of your hair is a number before the well. Before the woman came to the well, Jesus already knew everything about her. He knew that she had had five husbands and the man that she was with now was not her husband. He says, I want to give you something for that thirst. He wanted him to give her the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the, is the ability to be able to fill the void in your life. He says, listen, once I give you this living water. He begins to tell in the book of John, he says, listen, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. She's still not understanding it from the spiritual aspect. She's looking at it in the natural. She says, you know what? I want this water. You know why? That way I don't never have to come to this well again. Mm -hmm. What she's failing to realize is that he's not talking about the well of getting water. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Anytime you have a dream or anything that's ever dealing with water, the God is a representation of what? The Holy Spirit. Anytime. He says, listen, I want to give you spiritual water. And then you know what? You will never thirst again. Now, listen, she comes to the well for water because she has a thirst. 
Most of the time, she probably come there and gets water for the whole village because if she she um, she gets water, and then she probably brings that water back, and someone else is able to drink off that water too. This is what Jesus is teaching us. So when he says, "Listen, I'm going to give you a water that you're going to be able to give out also." Here's the blessing in that the the uh, true revelation of meaning of what God wants to do to you in our life. God wants to fill us up that we're able to what pour into somebody else. The Bible says what? That my cup may be able to what? Run over. God has given me something to be able to what? Pour into somebody else. So when God fills me up, he gives me the ability to be able to what? Pour into somebody else. He tells this woman also too, he says, listen, let me fix the desire that or the thirst that you have in you because the problem is, is that you have had five husbands. I'm not getting on you for have five husbands, she said, but the reason why you can't keep the, the husbands that you have is because there's a thirst that's inside of you. Mm-hmm. Nothing, listen, we go from situation to situation, job from job, relationship to relationship, place to place, and you know what? There's no fulfillment in nothing. Mm-hmm. When he says, I came to give you life and give you life more abundantly, mm-hmm. he said, I'm not giving you the best of life. I remember I read a quote, he says, God has not given us, um, what did he say, um, God has not given us all things that we may enjoy life. He's given us life that we may enjoy all things. Right. Notice right. this. People fail to realize. When somebody says you're blessed, mm-hmm. blessed doesn't mean that you have a lot. Blessed means to be content in that which you have. Once the, the real meaning of blessed means to what? Be happy. Yeah. Notice this. There's people that have so many things that you will not want, but they're still not happy. They're still arguing, bickering. You turn on TV. You turn on love and hip-hop. You turn on the basketball wives. And the only thing they're doing is throwing drinks at each other and cussing each other out and living their worst lives. But they seem to have everything that we may have, you know, that we may want. But it doesn't seem that way when you actually look deeper into it. The life is not blessed. The thing about God is when God blesses you, he gives you the ability. He talks about it in the book of Ecclesiastes. He said, there's an evil that I've seen under the sun. For God has given a man many riches and many things, but God has not given them the ability to be able to what? Enjoy it. How many of us have things, but you don't have the ability to be able to enjoy it? You know what I'm saying? Is that you may have something, but you can't enjoy it. You don't have the spirit to be able to enjoy it. No matter what you have, it's never enough. Because the problem is you find yourself, what, filling the wrong void. You're going and paying for everything, but you still have what? Nothing. Jesus is teaching here. He says, listen, if I can fix your spirit, I can fix what you spend. If I can fix your spirit, I can fix what you spend. But I must, what, first be able to what? Fix your spirit. In the in the uh, the book of go back to go back to the prodigal son here for a second too. Luke chapter fifty. I'm jumping back and forth for stories. I want you, baby, to get this. A certain man had two sons. The younger the son, the younger of them said to his father, "Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me." So he divided to them his livelihood. They asked the father for something. The father gave it. He divided to them what his livelihood. The Bible says, and not many days after. The youngest son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possession on uh, prodigal living. Let me teach you something about it. There was two sons. He got his money. He stayed still. Mm-hmm. One of the sons got his money. Stayed still. One of the money. One of the sons got his money. He stayed still for a second. Then he decided to move. He got what he wanted, and then he left. Notice this. A lot of people don't teach what was in the prodigal son. I believe that the prodigal son got tired of living in his father's house, wanted to be able to venture out on his own and kind of see what was out there. So he asked for his inheritance, but notice this, one of the sons got his inheritance and stayed put. Mm-hmm. One of the sons got his inheritance and said, you know what, I'm going to go out here and explore the world. He had a thirst that was inside of him. The Bible never tells us where that thirst came from, but he had a thirst to be able to what? See what was out there. One of the other sons decided to be able to stay grounded. Let me teach you something about God. If God blesses you with something, in order to be able to keep what God has, you must be able to stay grounded with God. The further you get away from God, the more it will cost you to be able to spend to to fill the void or the need or the thirst that's inside of you. It says that not many days after the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, there he wasted his possessions with prodigal or riotous living. But when he had spent all, just like the woman with the issue of blood, spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Notice this. The place when God comes is when we have what? Spent all, when there's nothing left. Mm-hmm. God allows you enough to be able to what? Run out. Okay. It's amazing that, you know what? Once he, once he had divided to him, 
his portion. He allowed him enough of his portion to be able to run out. And notice this. Once the, once the portion ran out, it stopped him in his tracks. Yep. See, I was telling somebody the other day, like, Pastor you know what, man? I'm going to come to church. I'm going to get it together. This, this, and that. I said, you know what? I know you're going to come. I know it's not. I'm not talking about coming to church. I'm talking about coming to God. Because what's going to happen is that we all have a place in our life where the funds run out. You get to a place you can't buy drugs, you can't buy cigarettes, you can't even support yourself anymore. Your credit cards are all charged up. You can't make another move. You have what? Spent all trying to keep up with what? You. Mm-hmm. Trying to keep up with the Joneses, whatever the situation may be. You have definitely spent all. And this is where God comes in. God comes into the place with what? You have definitely what? Spent all. There is nothing left. He says, but when he had spent all there, arose a severe firm in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. He sent them into his fields to feed his swine. Notice this, God, he's at the bottom now. Yep. Here's, a, here's a great scripture I like to teach, but I'm not going to stay here long. He says, as he would have filled his stomach with the paws that swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he had money, he was giving everybody everything. everything. But at his lowest, nobody gave him what? Nothing. But when he came to himself, this is the part I like right here. He came to himself, meaning he had an epiphany. He said, you know what? I, I shouldn't be living like this. How many of us got so far away from God and you get to a place, you say, you know what? This ain't what God called me to do. Yes, the spiritual man kicks in, right? Yes. The spiritual man kicks in in a place. You say, you know what? This is not the way I'm supposed to be living. You start going back. You say, I was raised in church. And this, I, I, then, and the scripture started to come back to you. Yes. Everything you like, you say, you know, I'm, I'm a child of God. I shouldn't be. Living this way. I shouldn't be out here like this. Okay. That's what it means when he says he came to himself. There's a time when we get far from God and all of a sudden we come to ourselves. Mm-hmm. Say, hold up, man. I didn't I let myself go. Mm-hmm. I've, I've gotten way a long way from God. Mm-hmm. He says this to himself. When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? You know what he said? Listen, he said, my father have, listen, my father, who I'm in relationship with, have hired servants who are living better than what I am living right now. This is when he comes to the bottom. He said, you know what? I don't have to be living like this because I know that I'm a king's kid. I know who my father is. Yes, sir. Everybody has these epiphanies. Time to say, you know what? I don't have to be living right for this. I don't have to accept this way of living. And you basically come to yourself. Let me show you something. Go to um, what was that in this? Okay, drop down a little bit. I want to show you something. That's what that's what it was. I had it here. Verse twenty-five, dealing with the brother who didn't leave. Mm-hmm. Now his older son was in the field. This is when the prodigal son decides to return. And as he came, he drew new to the house. He heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked, what do these things mean? And he said to him, your brother has come and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf, but he was angry and would not go in. The brother that decided to stay was upset when the brother who decided to leave came back. Yeah. Let me teach you what, this is a really churchy mentality right here. If I was to teach, if I was to stay, to stay in that scripture, member versus servant, this is a, this is a churchy mentality. You know why? Because why would you be upset with your father if your brother decides to come back? But he's going to teach it to you right here. He says, you know what? I've been here with you all this time. You ever, never, never threw me a party. Never did anything for it. But you know what? Your son comes back who has been out there blowing all this money with riders living. And now you allow him to come back. This is how people find themselves in jealousy. My God. Even in the church. I've been serving in the church. I've been, I've been coming to church, doing all the Bible study, and she's been out there, and all of a sudden she come back, and this person comes back and get blessed. My God. <laughs> Hear what the Father speaks on that. He said he was angry and would not go in. There's a lot of people in the church right now who are bitter because other people are being blessed, not even understanding the whole story. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. His father said, let me check you on basically what's going on here before you have this attitude. He said, so he answered and said to his father, Although these many years I have been serving you, I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat. And I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as 
This son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots. You killed the fatted calf for him. But I've been serving you all this time. But as soon as your son comes back, you want to slay the fatted calf. But I've been here with you all this time. Yes. How many of us know that, as the Father began to teach him, that the Bible said that the angels in heaven rejoices with one sinner repentance? Yes. Yes. I mean, listen, God is, God rejoices when we what? Come back. Come back. Thank you, God. Listen to what the Father tells the Son. He said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is what? Yours. Listen, he had his inheritance, and he said, guess what? Not only do you have your inheritance, Everything I have is what? Yours. Yours. So you, you're complaining about him leaving and come back, but not only do you have your own inheritance because you stay, everything I have, what? Belongs to you also. But he's upset because his brother came back and he felt like, you know, you threw him a party, but he said, listen, you stayed, you stayed with me. Now notice this. The brother had an opportunity to stay too, but he blew everything he had. He had his own, plus he had everything that his father had what? Given them. Go to Genesis. I want to show you something in Genesis. Very, very important. I believe it's the book, it's the book of Genesis chapter 3. Remember, I remember I'm, telling, I'm teaching you about what it costs you. Your issue will cost you. Genesis chapter 3, 17. Now listen, something somebody really never paid attention to. Matter of fact, look at Look at this real quick. Before you go to Genesis 3, go to 2. I'll explain it better from 2 and I'll take you over to 3. Okay. Genesis chapter 2 says this. Verse 15. I'll teach you from this aspect. The Lord said to the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Mm. Remember, I said your issue will cost you something? Yeah, your issue. Notice this. Does everybody's Bible say freely eat? Yes. Freely, right? So if I tell you you may freely eat, that means it won't cost you anything, right? It's free. Mm -hmm. Meaning that it doesn't cost you anything. Mm -hmm. When the serpent talks to Eve in verse, in chapter 3, verse 1, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, God has indeed said you should not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree was in the midst of the garden. God has said, you shall not eat it nor touch it, lest she die. Mm -hmm. Notice this. Mm -hmm. The woman never mentioned we may freely eat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When the serpent got her to quote it back, mm -hmm. he got her to quote it without the freely part. Yeah. See the problem, you know how we learn to quote scripture, don't put everything in there. See the thing is though, you the deception is you quote scripture. The right thing is that you quote the scripture right. Amen. Study to show thyself a prove a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. I mean, if you're gonna quote scripture, at least quote it right. We may freely eat from all the trees of the God. Your tree gonna cost me something. Yeah. See, but what the problem is, if you're talking to the devil, learn how to quote the scripture back because he has you by what you quote back. Uh -huh. He did the same thing to Jesus. What did God say? Didn't God say jump? And he said, listen, he will, he will, he will raise you up, cast you up, lest you bear your foot against a stone. Uh -huh. He quoted the Bible right to Jesus, but he quoted it out of his context. Uh -huh. the, 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 the woman is talking to the devil, the, most, the serpent, the most cunning uh, creature that God has ever created. And notice that she missed the part of the Bible. Or, or the part of the scripture that says what? We may freely eat. Mm -hmm. freely. The Bible says, for the weight of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice this. They said that we may freely eat of this tree, meaning it won't cost me nothing. But the tree that the serpent is in, if I eat of this tree, it is going to cost me something. Yes. Mm -hmm. Genesis chapter 3. Same chapter. Look at verse 17. After they took up the tree. Then Adam, he said, because you have indeed, because you have heeded to the voice of your wife and eaten from the tree, which I commanded you, saying you should not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake in the toil. You shall eat of it all the days of your life. My God. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you mm -hmm. and you shall eat the herb of the field in the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread. What is it called? What did it cost them to eat of the tree? 
It cost him everything in the garden. It cost him his position in the garden. Notice this. Until Adam took from the tree of knowledge and good and evil, he never had to plant anything for it to grow. Everything just grew. He had grew freely, and he was free to eat it. Now what God is going to teach him this. God says, now, because of your sin, you're going to have to work hard to be able to get the very thing I was giving you what? Freely. My God. Wow. See what we feel to realize that listen, there's see God was giving everything free and we indulge in something. Now everything is gonna cost us something. Mm-hmm. What did it cost him? It said, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread mm-hmm. till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you shall what? Return. return. My God. You know what? I truly believe this, and a lot of people if, if the scripture don't really teach it, but from a spiritual aspect of it, the the tree. When people begin to say, what type of tree? I believe there were trees that was able to feed their spirit. The reason why? Because they were spiritual beings in the Garden of Eden. But notice this. God made trees. God had created trees inside of the garden. I truly believe that the Garden of Eden was a type of heaven here on earth. The way it was set up. And not just the way it was set up, that the way they was blocked out of it when they, they sinned. They were not able to go back into it. Another reason why I believe that the Garden of Eden was a type of heaven here on earth is because the Bible says that also in the garden was a tree of life. Yes, yes, yes. And the reason why God had to put the um, the angels to be able to block it and the spinning sword in the garden to stop them once he kicked them out to stop them from going on going back in there because the Bible teaches that if they if why they're in that sinful state, yes. if they take from the tree of life, then sin will dwell forever. So what happened, what God was saying, listen, I can't allow them to take from the tree of life while they're in sin. You know why? Because that tree of life had to, that tree of life had to take a tree, if you get what I'm saying. Yes. The tree of life, which had to be Christ, had not yet been crucified for their sin, so therefore they couldn't take it. Yeah. See, that's what God says. He says, listen, My God. if you look at verse 22, I'm trying to teach you a little bit here. The Lord said, the, God, the, God, the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us. Yeah. To know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat of it and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. Yes. So he drove out the man and he placed a cherubim at the east one of the garden of Eden. A cherubim is an angel. Yes. And a flaming sword. Notice this, the Bible talks about the soul, which is the word of God. Oh, yes. For the word is quick, for the word of God is quick and powerful and what? Sharper than any two-edged sword. He put an angel with a sword. Many he put a sword, he put an angel with his word. Yeah. <laughs> a flaming sword which turned every way to guide the way of the tree of life. God had to protect man from Christ that was in the garden. Jesus was always in the garden. With Adam and Eve, but when Adam and Eve sinned, they, he could no longer give them access to Jesus My because they could, couldn't take from Jesus because he had not yet been slain. Yes. Yes. God says, listen, I can't give you Jesus until he has paid the cost Ooh. for what you have done in the garden. Yeah. My God. Once he's paid the cost, then you can take from him. Yes. That's why Jesus always said we take communion. He said, what? This is, this, he said, drink the blood, drink the wine for my blood, and the bread is for my flesh. Yes. He said, he is the true bread of life that comes down from heaven. Yes, now, here's a, now here's, a, here's a great teaching, too, is that when you think about if, 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 if Jesus was a type of tree that was in the garden when God said they may freely eat, what happened after that, once they became, once they died, which they did die in the garden eating, they died in the spiritual. Mm-hmm. Now they became flesh. Now, since they became flesh, they no longer are eating spiritual foods. They are eating natural foods. Yes. So for somebody to tell you and me that Adam and Eve took an apple mm-hmm. from out of God, it has to be wrong because they didn't take up physical foods until they what? Sinned yeah. and got pushed outside of the garden. So it couldn't have been an apple because an apple can't feed a spiritual person. Come on. He said you need spiritual food. He said you shall know a tree by its fruit. When he say you shall know a tree by its fruit, the Bible looks at you and I as trees. Here's a great teaching. When the man that was blind got his first healing, Jesus fell on the ground, touched his eyes, he asked the man, he said, what do you see? He said, I see people walking around as trees or like trees. Now you and I know that a man that has never saw before, how can he see people walking around like trees? 
what he was, what Jesus, what Jesus allowed him to see is the spirit before he allowed him to see the flesh. People say Jesus made a mistake. There was no mistake being made. The first time he healed him, he allowed him to see people as trees. Then he touched his eyes again and said he's so normal. Can I teach you? That God sees you and I as trees. Yes. Yes. So listen, when God be teaching you and I about the type of people to deal with, I deal with people according to the fruit they give off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. What type of fruit do you have? I'm not talking about how much money you have. I say how much how much fruit do you yes, have? Meaning, can I can 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 I, can I can I can I eat from what you have? Yes. Does what you have help me? Does it inspire me? Does it yes. does it uplift? Does it edify? Yes. I'm not saying you're a bad person. I'm just saying you just don't have good fruit. Good go. Come on. Oh, yes. See, when you become spiritual. You, you, you begin to learn to stop calling people bad and good and you just say that person just don't have good fruit. <laughs> the fruit that you have when your tree is just not good for me. It's not that you're a bad person, but it has something to do with your roots and the way that you're planted. You don't have what? Good fruit. Jesus. People that gossip have, we, we think they have good fruit and we take of it because listen, the first time you say something, somebody knows something, you want to hurry up and hear it. But understand, though, people who gossip to you gossip about you. That's right. Oh, my God. Take a bone, bring a bone. Take a bone, bring a bone. Amen. That's true. Oh, Jesus. So, therefore, I have to remove myself from that fruit because when you gossip, when I gossip to you, I'll be gossiping right back to you. Yes. Yes. Come on, Pastor. So, what happened is, is that, listen, I have to watch. I don't deal with, I don't look at people good and bad. I just choose the people I, I like to get fruit from. Go to the book of Daniel. I think it's Daniel. Chapter 1. Where did I see that at? The book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, I believe it's chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. I'm still, since I'm still talking about this. Nebuchadnezzar had this dream. And I want you to hear what Nebuchadnezzar said. In the book of Daniel chapter 4, I believe around the 4th verse, Nebuchadnezzar was at rest. No, no, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts uh, on my bed and the vision of my head troubled me. Listen, the Bible says that in the book of Daniel chapter 4. No, that was chapter Three, I would do that. Is chapter four I was reading from. The Bible says that God will speak to us in dreams and in visions. Listen, I'm a dreamer. I'm, I'm, I'm very keen to when I have a dream, I pay a lot of attention to it. Mm-hmm. What God is saying. Sometimes when dreams come and dreams scare you, that's God's way of trying to get your attention. Mm-hmm. Even if you may not understand what it means, it's God's way of getting his attention. Nebuchadnezzar is not a man of God. And God, the holy God, our God has given him a dream. Something he wants him to pay attention to. Sometimes you got to listen to it. You keep having the same dream. You may want to pray about it. God, what is it, what is it that you're trying to tell me? You ever have a dream and you wake up and just don't sit well with you? you get, it's, so, it's so unsettling that you got to tell somebody about it. He said, I saw a dream that made me afraid and the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore, I issued a decree to bring me all the wise men of Babylon before me that they might, take, that, that they might make me known to the interpretation of my dream. He says, I called the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers came and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. Yeah. Can I teach you this? Is for The Bible talks about be keeping ourselves in good counsel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You have to watch if you are a dream and some of us are here, some of us not. If God gives you a dream, watch who you get the interpretation of your yeah. dream from. Come on, that's right. Because I've had some dreams and I've interpreted, because I'm going to teach you what? Tell you something, I have dreams about people. Sometimes I'm afraid to call people and tell them about my dream. Mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, my thing is, is, me being a man, I can't call a woman and say, hey, you know what, you was in a dream last night. Oh, no. She's going to think, so what, you, when do you want to meet for drinks? <laughs> <laughs> and um, that's not what God is saying. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? But my thing is that uh, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I dream, I want to be able to, uh, if God shows me somebody in the dream, yeah. the first thing I do is pray for that person and ask mm-hmm. God for the words to be able to say to that person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because God, you ever, you listen, God has, God may put a person in your dream and maybe you have the gift of intercession. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You may have that gift. Yeah. 
If you pray, if you dream about something, maybe God is trying. Listen, sometimes God will show you a person who don't even give you a word. Mm -hmm. And right then and there, you pray for that person. And then you may have to even ask God, God, is it something that you want me to say for that person? You know what? Or somebody might have said, you was in my dream last night. And this is such and such happened. I don't understand it. But you know what? I'm telling you I had the dream. Never try to interpret it. We want to be wild. This is what I think your dream means. Notice this. The Bible says that a man gift will make room from him. Mm -hmm. A lot of God's people are dreamers. Joseph was a dreamer. Mm -hmm. Now, Daniel is dreaming. Well, now that someone is dreaming, God has given him the interpretation of the dream. But here's how God promotes his people. Notice this is that God will give you the answer to the person where he's trying to promote you. Notice this. I've seen in places where you're the only one on your job who can do a certain thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know why that was given to you by God for promotion. Mm -hmm. But you looked at, why did they always get me to do something? Mm -hmm. God gave it to you for a reason. In this, in this particular situation, only one who can interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream is Daniel because God is going to give him what? The interpretation. Yes. Joseph, a man's gift will make room for him. Joseph was promoted because of what? His interpretation of the wine bearer and the cup bearer. So God will, God will set you in places to be able to give a what? An interpretation. Yes. When the Bible says, God says, I know of the way that I take it, thief, when I have tried that you may come forth as gold. What God will do, he sets you up in a place to use the gift that he's given you. And sometimes the gift is a lot of time his word. So you say, God, why do you have me going this way? Why are you taking me this way? Why am I in this particular place? God says, I'm trying to get you to operate in your gift. Hmm. Notice this. God's people are, even though they, they may have been praying to get out, they were always submissive to the higher authority. You know why? Because God always plants his people under the authority of the devil to show that he's God. Mm -hmm. yes, that's right. You, you got to understand what I just said. God places his people under the authority of people who worship the devil to show that he's to the worship the devil to show that he's God. Yep. The Bible says, let your lights shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father that's in heaven. Right. God places you in a house of everybody who don't serve him and you're the only one to serve him. Yeah. In a place in a job where you're the only one to serving him, full of what? A lot of people who don't serve him. Yeah. And we say, you know what, God, you're making my walk hard because I'm around all these particular bad people. God says, I'm not going to remove you. I need you to shine right there. Yep. You missed that. Because a lot of us are always looking for God. God, remove me from this place. God says, no, I have you in that place to shine. Mm -hmm. You know what happens if you got in the, at, at nighttime? If you take that lamppost off that street, people will run into each other. Yeah. Cars going to run into each other. That lamppost is there for a reason. It may be the only lamppost on that block, but it's there for what? A reason. Yeah. He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father that's in heaven. I'm wherever, wherever God plants me, I have to accept the calling and be a light right there where God plants me. Wherever God plants me, I have to be a light there. Yeah, I don't like my job. I don't like the people that work there and I'm getting tired of it. But you have to understand that your assignment is there. I was talking to someone over there. I said, listen, you have to watch out when you pray for God's will and you ask God for stuff because someone was teaching me, telling me about they were tired of being on the job they was on for a while. I said, you know what? Um, God is all about promotion because we got in the conversation. They said, Pastor, I've been tithing. I've been doing everything, but still I haven't got a promotion. I said, well, listen, if you're doing all those things and you haven't moved yet, you have an assignment that it has to be done. Yeah. And she said, what does that mean? I said, basically what that represents is this, is that God can't promote you until the assignment is done then. See, everybody thinks of ministry is just promotion to other places. No. Ministry is wherever you are. God may be trying to reach a person wherever yeah. you are. Mm -hmm. Could be your supervisor, it could be your coworker, yeah. it could be anything. Oh, okay. The faster you submit to God and your attitude to God, the faster you'll be promoted. Yeah. How many of us go to work and we got to supervise somebody we're not speaking to or somebody on a job we're not speaking to? Somebody we don't like at the job. But you're asking for promotion from that place. Yeah. Can I teach you? There is another person like that at the next job you're going to. Yeah, worse. Every job and place I've worked, there's always been a certain type of person. Yes. Let me teach you. 
Because God aligns things for the development of my character and spirit. Yes, indeed. And every job I work at, there's a person who thinks there's a super, they're the supervisor when the supervisor's not there. Uh, uh, yes, God. Uh, <laughs> Every job I work at, there's another employee who talks to me about another employee. Mm -hmm. Every job I worked at, there's somebody there who doesn't particularly like me that I have to go there and try to deal with every day. Uh -huh. I, I'm trying to show you, but God has put me there for a reason. Mm -hmm. More so, that reason is for me to be able to what? Learn how to be able to love people. He says, as much as lies within you, try to live peaceful with what? All men. God has me a plan in a place for the, not for just my development, as in for me to be a light in that place. Yes. I notice that when I don't pass certain tests, everywhere I go, that spirit goes, but it's just in yes. a different person. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> what I've learned to do is that I, I, I don't know the spirit's name, but I know its, I know its characteristics. I know yes. what it give off. I know it yes. because you ever notice that this person is just like that person. Yes. And you notice you'll go places and you say, you know, you was just like the person at my last. And then you notice that, you know what? I keep jumping from place to place. It's the I same spirit. I, I must got to fix something in me. Yes. 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 Exactly. Jesus taught them when they was in the boat and the winds and waves. And they said the waves begin to beat into the boat and um, they begin to wake up Jesus. And Jesus come because we're getting ready to drown. Don't you care that we drown? And Jesus came out and Jesus said, what? Well, peace be still. The Bible said he calmed the winds and the waves. Yeah. And then they were calm. Now, Jesus was upset that he had to do that, if you understand the teaching of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Jesus was basically upset because he said, why does, why do I have to calm the storm for you to have peace? Yes. <laughs> why can't you have, why did, why did you lose your peace in the midst of the storm? Why did I have to calm the storm to give you peace? Uh -huh. Peace can't be turning something down. Uh -huh. My God. Peace is the ability to be able to just devour you. My God. My God. You ever say, I need peace of mind? And you get away from everything? Mm. You're just not at peace with yourself. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's it. You know what? Peace is being able to go anywhere and turn it down. Yeah. yeah. Peace is being able to go, to go anywhere and know that you're not like and feel comfortable. Yes. Come on, yes. Peace is having issues and bills and all that type of stuff going on and still feel comfortable and not rattled, not shaken, unmovable, always abounding. Thank you, God. That's God. That's God. Peace is knowing that they're cutting hours but still show up like, okay. Yes, God. Peace is not caring about who they hired and know that God still got me. I don't work for this job. I work for God and God still got me. <laughs> you said I give you a peace that what surpasses oh, all understand. All understanding. Listen, I don't know how you have peace with all you have going on. Bad mm. mm. the Joe friends came over the house and Joe was still holding on to his peace. He still held on to his integrity. Yeah. He said, the Lord give, the Lord take it. And Joe friends begin to come over there. And we have friends like Joe that every time something wrong's Ooh. happened, the first thing they say, what did you do? Uh -huh. <laughs> I wish Joe knew what he would have, I wish he knew in chapter 3 and 4 what he found out in 42. Uh -huh. 42, he found out that I went through all this for promotion. Yeah. You. you know what you got to tell people sometimes? Everything I'm going through right now, I'm getting ready to get promoted. That's how you got to speak it. You got people say, you got all that stuff going on in your life? Man, I'm, I'd be going crazy if I was you. Yeah, I'm, getting, I'm about to be promoted. Yep. Mm -hmm. This is how God promotes me. He's trying to see how faithful I'm going to be. Yes. 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 See, God promotion, it looks like a lot. You can't understand in the beginning. It looks like a lot of turmoil in the beginning. Yes. It looks crazy. It doesn't make sense when God is getting ready to promote you. Mm -hmm. Let's get back to Nebuchadnezzar's dream. I'm almost there. Daniel chapter 4. He said, therefore, verse 7 of uh, Daniel chapter 4, the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers came and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. But at last, yeah. Daniel came before me. His name is Belshazzar. According to, the name, according to the name of my God, in him is his spirit. Now, here's the teaching. He named Daniel Belshazzar. According to his God, that's in the lowercase g. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He said, in him is the spirit of the holy God. Yes. Spelled with a capital G. Yeah. And I told the dream before him, saying, 
Belshazzar, the chief of the musicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you, and no secret troubles you. Explain to me the visions of my dreams that I have seen and its interpretation. These were the visions of my head while I was on my bed. I was looking and beholding a tree in the midst of the earth. Get blessed. What did I just read from Genesis chapter 3? Tree. tree. Where was the tree at? In the midst. Where was the tree? In the midst of the garden. He said, but the tree of, in the midst of the garden, mm -hmm. thou shalt not eat, lest she surely die. Yes. God has given, given him a scripture, given him a, a, um, a confirmation from what? Genesis. Adam, God told Adam and Eve to, that they can freely eat from all the trees of the garden, but the trees in the midst of the garden, the middle of the garden, thou shalt not eat unless thou shalt surely dry. I mean, die. God comes back. And he gives Nebuchadnezzar a dream about a tree. Yes. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in what? His season. He shall be like a tree. You shall know a tree by its fruit. Yes. God looks at us as a type of what? Trees. Yes. Going a little deeper to that, if you was to look into uh, Help me, help me, Lord. You know I got it. John 15 says this, since you want to know if you're a tree or not. John, keep your hand right there, Daniel. I'm coming back. My mind moving fast. Espresso. <laughs> I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Yes. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Yep, yes, yes. He said, listen, you are a type of tree. God is working on you. Yes. That's why you have seasons. Yes, child. You want to know more about yourself? Learn about how trees work and how they grow. Yeah. They go through seasons. Right now, they're, they're, they're shining. The leaves are out. They're tall. But then it's going to come to a place where the leaves are going to all fall off. But notice this. Regardless of what the season is, the tree still have its roots. Yes. yes. If you're grounded in God, you must know you're going to have, you're going to have what? Seasons. Yes. That's right. He said, be ready. In season and what? Out, out of season. season. Stay, stay grounded. Stay rooted. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Notice this. He's the vine. We are just the branches. He's checking you. He's putting you in check. He said, I'm the vine. You're just the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you cannot do nothing. So when the prodigal, going back to the prodigal son, once, once he got away from the father, he wasn't able to do anything. Matter of fact, he lost everything he had. Because he got himself away from the father. He, you're only prosperous when you're what? With the father. Oh, yes. That was Luke. Go back. That's what it was. Go, to, go back to Daniel. Daniel chapter 4, verse 10. He's talk, still talking to Nebuchadnezzar. A tree, Tomo, he says, I was looking and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. And let me paraphrase so you know what's happening. God showed Nebuchadnezzar himself, but he showed himself in the version of a tree. He showed him a tree, and he's showing and telling him everything that he was and everything he has became as a tree. He said the tree grew and became strong. That's what Nebuchadnezzar was. He was planted, he grew and became strong, meaning he became arrogant and cocky. The Bible says that he who humbles himself should be exalted, he who exalts himself shall be what? Humble. Humble. Bring down. He said his height reached to the heavens and it could be seen to all the ends of the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and it was food for all. I mean, this is who God had raised him up to be. The beasts of the field found shade under it, the birds of heavens grew in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw a vision in my head while on my bed. There was a watcher, a holy one who came down from heaven. The Bible says we are accomplished about with a, such a great a cloud of witnesses. As this tree is grown, there is a watcher. Yes. This watcher, somebody's watching. Yeah. I saw in the vision, man, there was a watcher. He cried aloud, and this is what the voice said. Chop the tree and cut off his branches. Oh He's talking about him as a person. Yes. First thing God says, so let me do is let me cut your, when I'm dealing with you, let me cut your branches off. Mm -hmm. 
Notices of your branches to go to fruit has to be next. Because you can't have fruit, fruit that grow off the branches. Yeah. So if your branches have been cut, there goes your fruit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First, God said, when I deal with you, I'm not gonna make it, I'm make it so you're not fruitful anymore. Yes. God says, deal with them, cut off what? The branches, strip off its leaves, scatter its fruit, let the beast get out from under it and the birds from its branches. My God. Still talking about him. Nevertheless, here's the blessing part. This is what God does. Nevertheless, leave the stump and the roots in the earth. <laughs> That's right. You know what God says? Tear them down, uh-huh. but leave the place where I can build them back up. Yes, yes, yes. He go. says, I chastise those whom I what? Love. Uh, yes. Even though God, if you, just to paraphrase the story, even though God has taken away the king, take strip Nebuchadnezzar down, He's never stopped loving him. Yeah. He left the stump there to give him a place to be able to what? Grow back. His roots are still in the ground. Yes. He's still grounded, but he's chopped off. But he's still grounded. Look what God says. Look, let me go to He says, um, Nevertheless, leave the stump and the roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Let him graze with the beasts. Of the grass of the earth, let it cha- let his heart be changed from that of a man, and let him be given the heart of a beast, and let seven times pass over him. My God. I'm trying to find the part where he it's a part of him whenever we tell whenever Denise actually shows and that he takes the kingdom away from him. 18. Is it 18? Yeah, it says, this, this dream I never can either have seen them, Belshazzar declares interpretation since all the wise men of the king are not able to make it known. Oh, that's what Daniel, that's what Daniel told him in 19. Daniel said in, in uh, verse 19, when he interprets the dream, he says, that Belshazzar, who was astonished for a time and his thoughts troubled him. So the king spoke and said to Belshazzar, do not let the dream or interpretation trouble you. Belshazzar answered and said, My Lord made the dream concern those who hate you, and its interpretation concern your enemies. The tree that you saw, which grew and became I'm sorry, the tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached the heaven, and which could be seen by all of the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, and who was uh, which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt in when in and whose branches the birds of the heaven have their home, he said, It is you. O oh, king, you have grown and become strong, for your greatness has grown and reaches the heavens and your dominion to the end of the earth. And as much as the king saw a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump and roots in the earth. Bound with a band of iron and bronze and the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew and let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. He says, um, this interpretation, O oh, king, this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon the Lord my King. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. Mm-hmm. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven seven times so you pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. So what Daniel was basically telling me, he was like, listen, you, the kingdom is going to be stripped away from you. You're going to be given the heart of the beast. And that's what happened to ne- ne- uh, Nebuchadnezzar for seven years. He was stripped of everything he has. He became like a beast. He began to eat up the ground, everything, just like a beast. Mm -hmm. And seven years went by because of the arrogance that had, what, taken place inside of him. And God was showing him, you know what, I got to chop you down because of the arrogance that you have inside of you. Seven years, seven years represent completion. I always like this story, too, because I did um, seven years. That's what I was given in prison. And God does that in a way of completion. So God was able to, what, strip him down. Of everything, but he still left the stump. And you know what? Once after the seven years of humility taking place, God yes. restored him. Yes. That's what the Bible teaches. He said, listen, humble yourself and you shall be exalted, and exalt yourself and you shall be humbled. Turn with me to Second Kings. I'm almost done. I believe it's Second Kings. I was never Kinesia. Let's talk about naming. Naaman was a great man. The Bible talks about a mighty man of God, but he had leprosy. And the prophet Elijah 
he was the prophet Elijah was sent to him to be able to heal him of his leprosy. But I want to show you since we're talking about counting the cost. The Naaman was then the Naaman in uh, Second Kings chapter five. Look around the ninth verse. Ninth verse. The Naaman went with his horses and chariot. He stood at the door of Elijah's house. Elijah sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. Yeah. Now, but Naaman became furious and went away and said, indeed, I said to myself, mm. yeah. he will surely come out to me and stand on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Heal the leper. Let me teach you something, right? The problem is he had leprosy, but yeah, I, I taught this before. Leprosy wasn't his only problem. Yeah. You know his other problem he had that was greater than his leprosy? Pride. Uh -huh. Pride will say, listen, I'm too great to do this. I'm too big for this. <laughs> the man of God sent him to the Jordan. Yes, the Jordan wasn't the cleanest river, but how bad do you want to get healed of your leprosy? That's right. Has God ever sent you an assignment that you didn't want to do? Mm -hmm. You're too good to go there, right? You're too good to be seen talking to this person. My God. <laughs> Basically, what he said, man, I won't be caught dead washing the waters. You mean to tell me that my deliverance can't come from some cleaner waters? Basically, that's the. When he began to go into, he says, verse 12, are not the Abana and the Farper, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Let me teach you, it's not the water that's going to give you deliverance. It's the obedience. Yes. God says that obedience is better than sacrifice. Yes. You know, the thing is that, I always, that God always, any time I, I know that something is God, there's always something that makes me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going with this teaching right here. When God tells you to do it, it's uncomfortable. A lot of times if it's comfortable you're doing it, it's not God. Mm -hmm. Yes. God will tell you, listen, in order, in order for you to get your healing, you must first what? Forgive. And you'll say something like, you know what? Well, I'm just not going to forgive then. I don't want it that bad. Just like, just like I'm um, naming this situation. He wants to be healed of his leprosy, but he don't want to do what God is telling him to do. You know why? Because he has developed a certain stature. A... Um, you know, people look at him a certain way, and he's like, you know what, I, I, I dare not go dump myself seven times mm -hmm. in the Jordan because it's, it's not clean. Yeah. He said, I can think of some cleaner waters. But God wanted him to go there because he didn't, it was, his, his um, how did I teach it before, his pride was attached to his leprosy. Yeah. Meaning this, he had an inner thing that was going on that needed to be dealt with. See, leprosy, just like the woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years, he probably was trying to treat his leprosy, but could never what? Get it under submission. Yeah. God has given him an opportunity to freely yes. get rid of his leprosy. Freely. But he doesn't like the manner in which God is telling him to do it. You know what about him? What I think I like him when he had a servant. He says, so he says, um, I could not wash in them and be clean. In verse 12, so he turned and went away in a rage. His servant came near and spoke to him, saying, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? Mm -hmm. If he had told you to do a great thing, you would have easily did that. But how much more than when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. You know, one thing that God showed me in the story about Naaman is that it had nothing to do with him. His leprosy was attached to the fact that he had so much pride. And what God was showing me too, listen, a lot of times what God is trying to do is attach to your pride what you don't want to do. You know, a lot of times, a lot of our healing and things are attached to our forgiveness. My God. A lot of a lot of time you say, you know what, I'm trying to do all these things to be able to what? Be healed, but you still having what? Forget it. Yeah. And God is always putting you and I in uncomfortable places because what? You, when he says obedience is better than sacrifice, somehow you being obedient is going to break the curses over everything that's in your life. Yes, yes. Because our obedience basically started with what happened to Adam and Eve. They were disobedient. Disobedience yeah. brought us into this place right now. 
Praise God. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your time. We thank you for all you've done here today. Thank you, Father God, for just continuing to keep us and bless us, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I am the voice pastor. Q. Thank all you guys for joining in. I left all the uh, donation in the comments. You guys be blessed.